So this unit is on the liability and legalities around rehoming your dog. Um, a question that comes into multiple dog households or homes that are um, dealing with a lot of stress and anxiety regarding their dog's behavior, um, changes within the home environment that affect you know, whether or not keeping the dog is the right thing to do. Um, this is an educational slideshow that lets you understand not only the liability that can be carried, the legalities of your choice to rehome a dog, um, as well as the ins and outs of a lot of alternative options that people seem to think are appropriate. So we're going to jump right into it. So first, the thing to discuss is the timeline of liability. Now, if it is a very big misnomer when people say, you know, dogs are property. Yes, legally dogs are property. And when you rehome a dog, the notion is that all, li li all of the liability transfers with the transfer of ownership. Unfortunately, that is not the case um, when it comes to tort law. So let's look at this timeline, 2015. You rehome a dog for displaying aggressive behaviors. You tell them, being the new owners, uh, that the dog is fearful, um, may have fear-based behaviors, you describe them, whatever, but the dog hasn't bitten anyone, or it has bitten someone, and you let them know verbally or in a text or an email the situation surrounding that bite. You might even say things like, don't recommend, you know, have kids or other dogs, it needs to be an only dog household. So 2016 comes along, the new owners get bitten by the dog and need medical treatment. 2017, you get notification from the new owners that they are suing you for medical costs and damages, citing that you didn't inform them or that the behavior was downplayed. In 2018, you are held responsible. Most trial hearings take a little longer, but in 2018, you were held responsible for the damages and must pay um, all of the monetary fees uh, that if you can't afford it, assets can be liquidated to cover legal fees. Um, paychecks can be garnished, wages can be garnished, tax return refunds can be garnished, personal assets can be garnished um, to fulfill that. You know, you would have the right to appeal, um, but that's not always the case. So this is one timeline of liability and how um, the bite or behavior of a dog can affect you even after you no longer possess or own or control the dog. Second one, 2013, you rehome a dog for displaying aggressive behaviors. You tell them that they're fearful, etc., but the dog hasn't bitten anyone or it has. You tell them verbally in a text or writing in an email what the issues surrounding those things were. New owners have no issues with the dogs for years. Now, this dog was adopted out in 2013. This dog had no issues as of 2019. New owners take the dog out to go potty and it bites a child in 2020. This is now a senior dog more than likely and could be dealing with a variety of issues due to age related, etc. 2020, you get notification from the new owners and the victim that you are a third party that is being sued um, for medical costs and damages, citing that you didn't inform them or it was downplayed and your negligence resulted in the bite of this child. Whether or not that's true at this point doesn't matter, you're still having to go through it. When you are considering adopting out a dog that has a behavioral history, whether it has resulted in a bite, a nip, um, you know, some sort of you know, muzzle punching, any sort of aggressive behavior, resource guarding, etc., you need to have an attorney involved. You need to pay the attorney fees so that you can have a release of liability and a full disclosure <clears throat> provided to the new people that holds you harmless. So anything that they do with their animal coming from that point forward keeps you protected. And this is really important because it will fully disclose any and all behaviors in their um, very, very legally respectful glory, which is not going to make your dog sound good at all, um, and will probably make it sound worse than it is, because you need to be protected. And this is a huge issue. Um, both of these cases, by the way, are cases that I've had to deal with. They actually exist. The original dog owners were held responsible financially 
for the injuries were caused in both of these bites. So it's very important to realize um, that these things happen and that when you consider rehoming a dog, it's not that simple. If this is your nine month old golden retriever puppy that has absolutely no behavioral history that loves everybody and you're moving and you just can't keep it, that is a completely different situation. And I still recommend having a release of liability um, in the event that something happens so you don't end up in this type of situation. However, you can. So it is really, 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 really important. I cannot stress that enough to fully understand what you are doing, where your responsibility lies, and how you need to handle things. The realities of rescue. So I'm going to break some things down because I see this one going around a lot all the time. Oh, I'm going to send my dog to this rescue. Um, uh, I'm going to call all these rescues. Or they're spending, because I work with several rescues that are freaking amazing. Um, they're spending days, days and days calling all of these rescues and shelters to find out who will take the dog. If the dog has bitten two people or the dog has resource guarding or the dog has severe separation anxiety. And the rescues are saying, sorry, we can't take your dog. Most of them will try to send you to someone that they know of who could potentially help. And they're doing this for a reason. I'm going to give you a, just a random idea for a board and train. Because when a rescue takes in a dog with behavior problems, they cannot put them into a normal foster home or put them into a normal kennel because they're not ever going to be able to adopt that dog. And the reality is a very few percentage of the behavior cases that they do take are ever going to be able to be adopted. So say that we have a behavioral intervention program that lasts for six weeks and costs $5,500. That's not an out there number, by the way. And this is with a credentialed dog behavior consultant, a credentialed dog trainer, somebody who is fear free, someone who's done a bunch of education, takes on this dog for this rescue, works with it for probably seven or eight weeks, um, even though this would be a five week program typically, addressing the behaviors, creates follow up plan for the foster home and helps to integrate that dog into a foster home. That person then has to charge more than likely to come out because they can't disrupt their ability to make a living to help give back. Now there's probably a discount involved in there, but it's not gonna be that substantial because our liability with a dog like this goes up, especially when it's a dog that's not in the home with the owner. So then they're gonna charge to transition the dog from the foster home in with the new family, make sure that the new family understands everything that they're getting body language and behavior training, etc. So say we add on another $550. So now we're at $6,050. That is just for training and behavior intervention. That is not the average of $150 a month in feed and random medical things that happen when a dog is in a shelter or rescue environment. That is not including the $24 a day average um, shelter kennel space fee that it costs for the overhead to cover that dog's care and living environment a day. Um, so if you have 30 days in a month, and I'm going to use a calculator for this because I am exhausted, and that's $24 a day, that's $720 a month. You are now looking at a total of $6,920. The adoption fee that they're likely going to charge for a dog like this is probably going to be between $150 and $300. And that's probably going to be less than the, the adoption fee they would charge for anybody else because they're trying to adopt out a dog that has behavioral issues. So the adoption fee needs to be whatever the cover of their lab work, their veterinary exam, and the spay and neuter or microchipping costs, and their vaccines, and that's about it which on average costs about $250 to $350 just for those things if you're going to a low cost veterinary clinic. Now, the average dogs that they could help with that $7,000 that they've put into this, dog, this one dog, say they could pull, rescue pull from a shelter, okay? That $7,000 minus $720 a month for the care of the dogs. So if you have 
So that's about 10 dogs. They can help pull out, save, and adopt out 10 dogs in a one month period for the same amount that they would take to deal with a dog for one month of care after it comes back from boarding and a two month-ish stay for boarding on one dog. And that is not including if that dog needs to stay for six months to a year, which is probably the average that a behavior case will stay in a rescue. Um, if they're in a shelter, they're likely not staying that long. Um, shelter environments, uh, no matter how they're set up, shelter or rescue, unless it's in a foster home, is not a natural environment. So then you're altering the behavior by adding increased stress from the kennel, lack of necessary physical and mental exercise. You can create boundary frustration behaviors, which can create a whole new problem. So when you think of, I will take my dog to a rescue or a shelter, you need to realize why it is they're telling you they can't take your dog. And it's because after all is said and done with that, they still face the same liability, but one that jeopardizes their ability to help all of the dogs that they work with, with absolutely no thanks, because it is beyond backbreaking labor, um, like heart gut-wrenching labor, some of the things that, that these amazing rescuers and, and shelter workers do um, for the animals that are surrendered. And you have to realize that there are circumstances that will warrant private adoptions and there are circumstances that may warrant a rescue surrender. They're not common. And certain criteria definitely needs to be worked through before those decisions become something that you put on your plate. So managed care is for those dogs who don't qualify for behavioral euthanasia. Um, therefore, the dogs that you've already had a very thorough uh, valuation by a credentialed dog behavior consultant and or a board certified veterinary behaviorist. If you had your master canine trainer, if you had your dog trainer that your vet recommended and they don't have those credentials, no disrespect, but the majority of them are not qualified to make a behavioral euthanasia, managed care, rehoming um, recommendation to you. So that being said, Managed care is when you have managed your environment to make sure that you have such an extreme level of environmental management going on that you can have zero issues. Um, it involves, you know, boarding the dogs that are not the quote unquote problem dogs at a separate facility, um, having a professional watch your dog in their facility. And for some dogs, that means using, if you're going to go out of town, using a daycare or boarding facility that has a top secured indoor outdoor environment with guillotine doors where they can get your dog onto one side of the kennel, drop the guillotine down, clean that side, make sure it's prepared and nice and friendly, bring your dog back in, drop the guillotine down again, and go clean the other side every single day. Um, it's no contact daycare and boarding. I'm sorry, not daycare. It's no contact boarding. Um, and it's meant to keep both people and the dog safe. So, um, there are facilities that exist and they require an owner who's willing to sometimes drive because they're not everywhere. It's an older style of kennel and now people want deluxe suites and, you know, nice, nice frilly things. And those are usually the dogs that get a raised bed with a blanket, if that, in a concrete cell environment that reminds you of a shelter because of the type of behavior they have negates the ability of people coming in and they tend to be a little bit more destructive in those environments. It means that you don't get to hire the $25 a day pet sitter. You have to hire the $125 a day facility to watch your dog. It means choosing to not take your dog somewhere that your dog is not going to do well. It means making sure that if you have people coming over, your dog is locked up and secured. It means that if your dog is having problems in your home, you have had the dog for so many years, you're about to have a child and you don't want to get rid of the dog, but the dog isn't somebody who really likes to be with you guys all the time anyway, then you might want to consider building them their own canine suite or casita, which can be done with a 10 by 10 shed that you've insulated. You've had an electrician help you with, so you don't light it on fire um, and give it its own designated circuit breaker so you can run a tiny little you know, temperature control area, put a TV in there and make them their own little indoor apartment and give them an outdoor area and make sure that every day you're spending time with them, that every day you're playing games with them and giving them 
physical and mental enrichment. Um, this can help prevent issues and give the dog a quality of life. The traditional quality of life skills have to do with pain, um, physical intolerance, and the quality of life of a human as far as how their caregiving aspects go. Most quality of life for dogs is measured the same way on all cases. However, when you're dealing with behavior, it's different. You need to look at how the hierarchy of needs is going to be met for your dog. And what that means is, how is my dog going to be able to receive um, the social and emotional and basic care interactions and needs from me every single day? And is that something that is realistically possible? Now, if it's something where, you know, I just, I'm so tired at the end of the day, I don't want to go do something for an extra 20, 30 minutes, you know, with that dog outside when I could just do it with all my dogs together, you know, that isn't necessarily um, something that I consider to be an, an exclusion because we did make a commitment. And if this was your child involved, um, you would put in that extra work. I would hope you would put in that extra work. There are those parents that don't. However, if it's something where your anxiety is so through the roof because of your dog's behavior um, or that it's, it's causing like a marriage meltdown and you're dealing with your own quality of life, just absolutely plummeting towards nothing because your whole life revolves around this dog that is a threat to you and other people's safety, then, you know, that's the way of behavioral euthanasia. And it sucks and it's not common. It's very uncommon. Um, but the biggest issue that people have with these options is that managed care out of all of them um, and sometimes behavioral euthanasia. I find it's done a lot more often when people have um, professionals, and I use that term very loosely, involved with their dogs that do not have the background or educational um, knowledge or wheelhouse or support to work with their clients in a way that helps to fully assess the situation before that's being made as a recommendation. So unless you have a credential dog behavior consultant or a board certified veterinary behaviorist that you're working with, I would not take the recommendation of euthanasia, even from my veterinarian based on behavioral issues without speaking to and having a thorough evaluation done by the other two. Because oftentimes there's an entire, it's like going from a chapter where you have like a book that you think is one chapter long to realizing there's 485 other chapters in this book that you never saw. Uh, because you're going into the world of behavior and finding the properly credentialed behavior professionals are the ones that are going to be able to be like, hey guys, this all exists here. There's so much stuff that we can do that we can work on in a safe manner. If you're committed to it, we can get it done. And then there's times where it's like, you know what? Yeah, your dog's behavior is so extreme. It's not only impacting your quality of life, it's impacting the dog's quality of life. And it's, it's a threat to yours and the public safety. And then it sits back on that table and it's something to be discussed. But the concept of passing the buck when it comes to dogs with behavior problems is very real. It is very sad and it's very stressful. I'm a credentialed trainer. I'm a credentialed dog behavior consultant. I'm fear free certified. I am the chairperson for the Association of Professional Dog Trainers, um, the education committee, and I love what I do. However, that being said, this aspect is not lost on me because I have recommended behavioral euthanasia before, but I can tell you exactly what the cases were, what the bite levels were, and the owners and how I helped support them through this process. It's not an easy choice to make. I have a managed care dog who's thriving. He's been managed care for about three years now. Um, he's not safe to have around my small child. So when we knew we were having her, we started transitioning him. It's not something you could do overnight. And it's something that you have to take your time in doing to ensure the safety of everybody involved and making sure that you're decreasing the stress levels as much as humanly possible. I do have clients with managed care dogs. They're not often, they're few and far in between, and they usually have an underlying medical condition that creates their behavior set because it cannot be normally addressed. Then I have clients where I'm like, you know, rehoming is an option because the dog's really 
doesn't have severe behaviors. The behaviors are really only subjected to X, Y, and Z. However, your quality of life or your inability to manage the environment consistently to meet the dog's needs, you know, isn't there. So things to understand is that you have options, 